Okay. Hello. So we have um we have these to do, and that's it for Victor actually. Um so let's just get into it. I always smell her before I see her. I have no words for that scent. It's uniquely her in every way. Mysterious, confusing, unnatural, not entirely unpleasant. Today, if a concept like today even exists anymore, she is ill. She walks in the rain without an umbrella or rain jacket like the fool she is. I've seen her ill thousands of times. I've seen her dying of cancer, bullet wounds, and hungry dogs. Many of those deaths were caused by my hands. I watch from a nearby alleyway as she approaches a crosswalk, eyes down at the ground, an oncoming car in the distance, the ever lovesick Sebastian following behind, never far from her, no matter where or when I find myself. The consistencies between places are as equally confusing as the inconsistencies. I think of them as places, for a lack of a better term. For all I know, I'm stuck in hell, limbo, or a coma in an eternal dreamland. Every place is similar, yet wildly different. This place immediately became my least favourite. It has put a spell on everyone around her, making us all obsess over her. Okay. It confirms my long-held suspicion that all of these places revolve around her. I still have no idea why. Before today, my least favourite place was a world overrun by wild dragons and stuck in the Dark Ages with humans rapidly becoming an endangered species. Dying by dragonfire was not as quick as one would suspect and a thousand times more painful. My favourite thus far was a world in which we were all some sort of human-like bird species, with large bat-like yet colourful wings. I miss the ability to fly. I'm a little bit confused. So. There are more worlds than just this one that he's being pulled into. So it's something about him that makes it so he knows about everything else. But then again, in Remembrance, isn't the whole thing that everyone seems to know her? And what happened in Obsession? I don't know. But now, this world is the one I hate most. This is my first experience of a place that manipulates and corrupts my thoughts. Ah. Places are generally generally about physical and external changes, although the core of one's identity persists between them. Sebastian always loves Falky. It is pathetic that love is a core part of his identity, but it is expected. Julian always suffers some inner struggle against himself. I understand him the least. <laughs> so does everyone else, probably. Quinn always seeks validation and approval. Alexander always fucks everything in sight. Brandon always delights in blood and fire. I think of myself as an exception, being that I seem to be the only one who retains memories between places. The odd one out, besides myself, is Valky. She is different in every place. She is the variable. I watch as the oncoming car approaches and she steps out into the crosswalk, eyes on the ground, lost in her thoughts. The driver is looking down from the road, probably distracted by his phone or radio. Sebastian notices the oncoming car too late. He is too far away, intending to conceal his stalking by following at a distance. The car strikes Falky. The body goes flying and lands with a thud on the cement. I know her neck is broken from the way she lands on her head. Her body goes limp immediately. The car that hit her screeches to a halt. I watch bored as Sebastian violently attacks the driver for murdering his soulmate. As she dies, the air around us begins vibrating. This version of this place is dying, just like her. Every place is connected to her life, as if it cannot exist without her. Just as the darkness takes over, I see Sebastian look up to the sky, confused. I always notice the end just seconds before we all cease to be. I am not worried. Somewhere out there, there is a version of this place where he saves Falky from the car accident. Probably a lot of them. Okay. Okay, that was interesting, because now we know that there are other worlds that he goes to. But he seems to be, like, stuck in this one. What I want to know is, how did he get out of those other worlds? Because surely he could extrapolate some information from those worlds and um, use them in this one. Or I guess he probably has at this point, right? And it just doesn't work. So I wonder why he's also stuck there, aware, when he's seemingly a human. Okay. It is obvious Quinn is the least affected by this place. The others often border on the edge of madness, myself included, but not Quinn. Instead, he borders on internal despair. I still don't know exactly what this place is. All I know is that it dominates and twists my thoughts around Valky. I simultaneously want her and want to brutally murder her. 
I am somehow sane enough to resist the drive to act on those feelings. Meanwhile, Quinn simply goes about his daily boring life. He lives with Valky, and typically they are close friends. This is this is enough to make him happy, I suppose. He always has a strange admiration and respect for Valky. Those feelings must be stronger than his desire. I resent him for his immunity to this mental corruption. I resent him being at peace. He typically seems to have the best outcome, no matter the place, but not always. None of us ever end up with a good outcome in the war in, in the end. We all cease to be when she chooses. What is she? The question haunts me day and night. A goddess? A devil? An alien? A computer programmer running a virtual reality simulator? Are we even real? The possibilities seem endless and impossible simultaneously. Why am I the only one who remembers? She must be lying. She must know. Nothing else makes sense. I think the person inside her knows, but she doesn't know. They walk towards the cafe, approaching close enough that I can hear them laugh, which grates on my nerves. A part of me likes the sound of her laugh. Another part wants to rip out her tongue and shove it down her throat so I never hear it again. I need to get a grip on my anger. But that's a pretty tall order when I've died more times than I can count. The fact I have any sanity left is a miracle. Quinn says something else and Valky laughs again. I wince at the sound. I pull out a gun from my waistband and consider shooting myself in the head again. But I remembered that pain from previous attempts and it would give me no relief. I take a step out of the alleyway, aim it at the back of Valky's head and fire the gun. I'm getting impatient. I need to get out of this place. I can accomplish nothing here. My body collapses forward. Quinn screams as blood splatters on his clothes. I wait for the world to end. Again. Alright. Okay. Okay. So yeah, that confirms what we already know. Quinn has some kind of immunity. Some ability to fight it. It is a mystery how no one around Julian sees his insanity. The man is always talking to himself aloud, mostly arguing with his own madness. He looks like a complete lunatic, but the cause of his madness engages my curiosity, I admit. I wonder about the extent of it. In some places, it's real, tangible, external. I once saw it as a ghost that haunted him, which made itself visible at will. I have seen it as an alternate personality that took over and made him behave strangely. In one place, it was an evil twin. In another place, a spiritual companion. companion. The majority of the time, it is only internal. Its name is always Ash. When it is external, does that mean it is a different intelligent being? What about when it's internal? Where does that being go? Is it actually inside of him? Is he not arguing with himself, but with a soul that is connected to him somehow? I'm quite curious. I wish I could split open his mind and find that soul within. I wonder if it's also tied to this nightmare that cages us all, but I doubt it. I don't sense it the way I sense the power in Valky or the aura that exists around her. I watch, unsurprised, as he carries Valky out of his torture chamber and carefully puts her in his vehicle. Her legs look broken, even from this distance. She's not screaming, begging, or crying. She simply buckles her seatbelt and remains quiet. She adapts to every situation as if she's made for the given scenario. She cries when she needs to cry and fights when she needs to fight. And yet, every outcome ends in tragedy. This is what confuses me the most in this hell. I long ago lost count of the places I experienced. The number is in the thousands. So many of them overlap, it's impossible to keep them straight. The only reason I remain sane is because those particles of memories are all blurry, as if they are scenes recalled from a dream. Many of them are similar in numerous ways. Every place has its own set of events that overlap, just like this one. Random events change and lead to new outcomes, but those new outcomes always lead to a reset until the place itself is destroyed. I am very grateful for the small mercy of poor recollection. If I remembered every detail, I would have no sanity left. But I remember enough to know this situation is real. And I remember enough to know her reactions are not consistent. In some, she might scream and fight. In others, she might plead and uh, beg and plead. In a rare few, she would have a moment of brilliance and find a way to turn the situation in her favour. And on rare occasion occasions, she might simply kill herself to escape. I couldn't blame her for that last one. I'd tried that many times. Eventually, we always wake up in some new place. There was always a new world to absorb, a new history to learn, sometimes entirely new abilities or supernatural elements to discover. She has to remember, right? Otherwise, wouldn't she simply make the same decisions over and over? We would be stuck in an indefinite loop, right? What else could cause the change if she didn't remember? Well... That is a point. But also... I think that the, 
yeah, you would be an indefinite loop, but that would just be one single timeline. The, the time timelines branch off because of different decisions. There are multiple versions of you that will do something differently just because. Just because that is a different choice, right? Why does it always end in tragedy? Because I think this is a prison. An experiment. If she was in control of all of this, why would she put herself through this? It doesn't make any sense. I watch in silence from across the street. Julian closes the door and walks around to the driver's side. I notice his clothes aren't bloody. He usually keeps a duffel bag in the trunk with clothes and cleaning supplies. I guess he has no current victim besides Valky. I could cross the street and check out the lair, see what he was up to, what kind of mess he left, but I didn't care. I'd done that enough times. The smell usually makes me sick, although the gore no longer troubles me. Julian slams the door, starts the car, and drives off. I sigh. A part of me screams to go rescue her, that twi twisted dark urge created by this place that I constantly struggle to resist. This urge is annoying. I've tried enough times in enough other places to know it never ends well. But it always ends, eventually. Why is this drive so powerful? Why do I keep thinking about her smiling face? Why do I want to kiss her so badly once again? Enraged by my powerlessness, I turn and punch the brick wall. My hand hurts and my skin rips. Droplets of blood fall to the sidewalk. I don't worry about the scars. They do not persist like these painful, fragmented memories. I wish I didn't remember all the times I held her, dried her tears, kissed her lips. Hey, why didn't we see any of that? There is no happiness for any of us, anywhere. Okay. I guess seeing that stuff wasn't super important, right? Oh, well. Of all the men, I hate Brandon the most. I can un totally understand that. Of all of them, uh, all of them annoy me. Sebastian cares about nothing but Valky to a disturbing extreme. Quinn always has uh, wants to do the right thing, even if it's to, to his if it's to his own detriment. Julian constantly fights a battle he can never win and is a constant brooding pity party. But Brandon is the worst. Maybe he reminds me of the worst parts of myself. He's selfish, power hungry, greedy, and driven. He refuses to surrender. He will never accept defeat and will play dirty to win. We're a little too alike sometimes. In this strange place where our lust and desire is twisted and put at the forefront of our minds, centered solely around Valky, it seems like we're almost identical. The only difference between us now is he doesn't know he's doomed to fail. Even if I try to tell him, even if I explain everything I have been through, even if I could prove I knew every possible outcome of every choice he may make, he would still keep trying. Without these memories, I probably would too. I would be convinced there was a path to success. I would refuse to accept that my goal was impossible, no matter the hurdles or barriers or enemies. I would expect to rise and conquer the challenge, even if I had to bleed the world dry to do it. I believed that for a long time. Although the idea was disturbing, it didn't surprise me that the concept of incest did not prevent his pursuit of a romantic relationship with Valky, even putting the twisted power of, his pla of this place aside. But in this place, the only one who would be entirely dissuaded by incest is Quinn. When Brandon or I have a goal, we will stop at nothing to achieve it. Maybe it reminds me too much of the futility of my reality. How many times have I tried to find a way out of this purgatory? How many paths have I pursued? How many of my own morals had I thrown out the window to find a solution? Who was I before all of this chaos started? Did I even exist before this? I have no answer. I have so many conflicting memories floating around in my mind that it is impossible to know dreams from reality. I wish I didn't remember. I'm tired of remembering, tired of waking up in a new place over and over, tired of watching those around me make the same mistakes repeatedly, tired of the world ending. But I have no choice in the matter. I am powerless. Every day I wake up, every day the world ends. Nothing I do makes any difference. Nothing any, th any of us do will change anything. Yet as I sit here and watch him sneak to, sneak to kiss his sister, I find myself angry and jealous. I could pursue her, I could be kissing her. I could have her, and I find myself desperately wanting her, and yet at the same time, I hate her. I blame her. I know she is the root of this hellish mayhem I live in every single day. I tried everything to end this cycle. I thought if I could give her a happy ending, maybe it would stop. But it seems like this place itself refuses to allow any of us happiness. Once, I thought I could make her surrender. I made her life a living nightmare, in every single path, in every single place, for what felt like years, hoping that she would give up creating new places, but it never stopped. I killed all the other men. I killed her. I killed myself. In one particular nightmarish hell, I had access to a nuclear, <laughs> nuclear bomb and detonated it right on top of her home. <gasps> Why the frag? I woke up the next day somewhere new. Okay. 
So he just randomly woke up with a nuclear bomb. This isn't me like going, going. Oh, that's not, that's not realistic. That's me going. Did someone give him that bomb to see what he would do with it? Or I don't know. He watches Valky blushes at his affections and looks around in fear of being caught. Brandon is strangely unconcerned. As I've watched the two of them together in this place, it almost seems like he wants them to be caught. I'd wager most of the servants know about their inappropriate relationship, but they keep their mouths shut. In their shoes, I would too. The messenger would be shut in this household. The idea of incest is unpleasant to me, but it doesn't disgust me to see them together. They usually aren't siblings. While their biological relationship is a fact here, it is not typical in other places. As I watch them together, I wonder why? Why this place? Why this scenario? Why are they siblings here? Who or what is creating all of these circumstances and granting this mysterious and twisted power to this place? What is there to gain from these infinite loops of pain? Why would she do this to herself? My eyes drift around them. I can still feel that presence. I think of it occasionally, like a large aura that surrounds her. I have no idea what it is or why I am the only one who feels it. I know it centers around her. If I leave the area, I no longer feel it. If she approaches without my knowledge, I sense the aura before I see her. There's no logical reason she would do this to herself. If that is true, that means someone or something... Uh, that, if that is true, that means someone or something else is creating all of this. But if that were true, why does it all center around her? And why the fuck are we all here, suffering alongside her? A woman's angry shout interrupts my looping thoughts. Their mother approaches. What was her name? Lucy or something? I can't recall. She grabs Valky by the wrist and roughly drags her away after an argument. Why give herself such an abusive mother? Why is her family in the Mafia? I have so many unanswerable questions. It's, it, I understand how he would begin to be like, oh, she is at the center of this, so she is the she knows about all of this. But also, it's just like he's questioning it now. But like, it just doesn't make sense because he's there unknowingly. Um. So shouldn't he be like, oh, maybe she's also there unknowingly, and this like presence is what's doing this, not her. But I guess he he thinks they're one and the same, which I guess they are, but they're also not, right? I'm, uh, the mother is a woman I've seen often, although she's never at the core like the other men. It makes me wonder about Isabella. I haven't seen her around much here. Why are some of us more involved than others? Every question creates more questions. Brandon is guided away by some stranger, one of his combat trainers or something. The two siblings are always pulled apart. This scenario seems doomed before the start, which just confuses me further. What is the point of all this? Is this truly hell? Once again, I seriously consider this possibility, but I don't want to accept the futility of that reality. Yet, it seems like it may be the only logical possibility. It answers all my questions, except for the aura. If this is truly hell, does an aura like that mean Valky is some kind of demon setting up these events and leading them to their most torturous conclusions? Is she a demon that feeds off misery and suffering? If I accept all that as truth, then that means this suffering doesn't revolve around Valky at all. It is centered around me. Because I am the only one who remembers. Am I the one being punished? If this continues, it will eventually drive me mad. How much longer can I last? It is interesting, isn't it? Because they think that... I don't I honestly don't remember in Quinn's root if they see the girl who comes out of her. I don't remember at all. I don't remember that. But, like, they didn't think there was anything special about Valky. But there is. So doesn't that mean there can be something special about him as well? Like another punished thing? I forgot what they're called. Yeah, oh, whatever. Okay. Um, side stories. This last one. Okay. Her days are boring, and yet I feel I felt envious. How do I escape this cycling hell? Can I escape? The thought haunted me day and night. Was it even possible? Was this my entire eternal existence? This hell? I'd rather be burning alive in eternal flame. My existence mimicked Sisyphus, only more maddening due to the endless suffering. Another dreadful reoccurring thought popped into my mind once again. What if this life, this was life in totality? What if this was the reality of reincarnation in existence? What if this was what happened to everyone? What if the sole problem was the fact that I retained memories? Otherwise, I would be no different than them. My life would be drudgery too. I shook the internal thought, 
thought from my mind for the millionth time. There were too many abno abnormalities for that to be true. The world ended and she was the source. I'd experienced it personally again and again. That could not be normal. But what if I could prevent the end of the world? Somehow. But I'd tried that and I'd failed a million times. My repeated failures to accomplish what goal clawed, that goal clawed at my mind, as did my human stubbornness. What if there was a way? What if that was my mission, the reason I retained these memories, the key to ending our collective eternal suffering? These were foolish dreams of a hopeful child long dead. But what if? The customer in front of me took their order and moved along. I stepped forward. She smiled at me with cheerful and genuine happiness. It grated on my nerves. Envy. I also wanted to be a clueless, normal human, content with a boring life, unaware of this cycle of torment. What can I get you, sir? Coffee. Black. My tone was unintentionally snappy. Her bright smile faded, and I missed seeing it. The malevolent, ma manipulative atmosphere of this place left me hesitant to involve myself for fear I would lose control. This place was too dangerous to indulge in self-entertaining. I hated her, but I missed her. I was accustomed to her presence, to that scent, that aura, that grating voice, that cheerful attitude, the hope, curiosity, naivete, stubbornness. No, not stubborn. She wasn't particularly stubborn in this world. A small but, insignif uh, but significant change. Such a shift was rare, but this place had been particularly cruel to her. That aspect of her was broken. It made me sad. This place was ruthless. Despite our numerous and varied upbringings, we always became the same people in the end, more or less. Was that proof that nature overpowered nurture? Or was that a part of the torture? I wasn't worried. It would be back in the next place. Then I'd feel like a fool for missing that frustrating trait. Can I get you anything else? She handed me the coffee I used as an excuse to face her. I took it and handed her, my, her a credit card. Julian, the possessed freak, was eyeing me suspiciously from across the establishment. A stalker, Sebastian, was lurking outside, keeping his distance. I could barely see him through the window in the shadows outside. For them both, I was merely an overdressed customer with a shifty gaze. I was grateful Brandon wasn't around much, although his distance from her was unusual. Sorry about that. Um, the others were predictable. Brandon was a wild card, and that was uniquely frustrating. Have a nice day. He returned the card. I took my coffee and left without another word. I guess this is Sebastian's route, right? Because I remember seeing him really early on. Sebastian was once again following her down the dimly lit street after she left the diner that night in the rain, hidden among the shadows. I wondered how he got away with stalking her for so long without being noticed. She was often naive, yes, but not generally oblivious. A fun little idea occurred to me. I was bored and drawn to her. Oh, is this the one where she actually... he... this is where his route starts? I crossed the street and headed towards Valky. She was distracted, looking at her phone as she walked home. She was completely unaware of us both. I eyed Sebastian in the shadows as I stepped to her side. She paused and looked up at me when the crosswalk light shifted to red. Miss, are you aware someone is following you? Okay, so it's not the same one, because there was no stopping her from being run over. What? She spun around quickly. Due to Sebastian's abnormal height combined with his bright red hair, he was easy to spot when you were looking for him. When he turned and ran like a coward, that was all the confirmation she needed. Should I call the police? I, I don't know who that was. I noticed him in the shadows after I left the cafe. He was lingering, suspiciously. Would it be okay if I walked you home, miss? Mm, yeah, okay. I'd appreciate that. I'm Valky. Nice to meet you. My name is Victor. Someone was stalking you. Yeah, creepy, right? He was really tall with red hair. Was he cute, at least? Quinn, always so desperate. Quinn. Kidding, kidding, just trying to lighten the mood. Bullshit. I'll be going now, Valky. It was lovely to meet you. Huh? Already? Why don't... No, thank you. I have work tomorrow. Have a good evening. I quickly left the apartment. The more time I spent around Quinn, the more I wanted to tear him apart limb from limb for daring to flirt with my... I shook away the disturbing thoughts pushed into my mind by this place. She is not mine. And if I wanted it to be mine, this was the correct move. I knew that from experience. Idiot, idiot, idiot. Three days later, I stood outside the cafe, watching her as I realized my mistake. Except it wasn't a mistake. This place was telling me it was a mistake and my willpower was growing weary. She was different in this place. Less motivated, less determined, less curious, less stubborn. She wasn't going to seek me out. Although it was weird because that hadn't been true in regards to Julian. It was the only time in this place I saw her actively pursue someone else with, a de with determination, against all logic and reason. 
She became who she needed to be to achieve her goals, whatever those may be. It was even more evidence that all of this revolved around her. Why else would her goals change from branch to branch? Regardless, if I wanted something from her here, I couldn't simply dangle a chocolate in front of her face and expect her to jump. Not yet. She needed more. I didn't want to return to the cheap and trendy coffee shop, but my feet moved me forward. My thoughts, day and night, were consumed by her, not simply due to my rage and insanity, but now intense emotions and de desires were pumping through my blood. Victor, hi, nice to see you again. What can I get you? Coffee, black. Creative. She smiled and chuckled. I didn't want any of this cheap, disgusting coffee, but I needed an excuse to be here. I changed the topic. Any signs of your stalker? Her lips pressed into a thin line and she shook her head before glancing across the cafe. I followed her gaze. Julian was cleaning a table. No, but I mentioned it to my co-worker Julian. He said he also saw the same guy around and thought he was creepy too. So it's an ongoing thing. That's concerning. Yeah, Julian called his cop friend, but David said they couldn't do anything. No laws have been broken. At a minimum, loitering is a crime. I have no idea, but thank you for looking out for me. It's so scary to realize someone's been following me opportunity. I glanced over at Julian. I also find it concerning your co-worker knew and didn't tell you. Her eyes grew wide and she bit her lip. He wasn't sure. He didn't want to worry me over nothing. It wasn't nothing. Yeah. I'll stop by when I get off work and walk you home again. Oh, that's not. Please, I'll worry about you all evening if I don't. It wasn't entirely a lie. The great thing about Sebastian was that he was both predictable and persistent. He wasn't going to be scared off because his darling had noticed and was afraid. If anything, it would likely make him even more determined. He wouldn't want Valky to fear him. Now that she knew he existed, he had to fix everything. Predicting when Sebastian would make his move was easy. He'd want to catch her alone and soon, but somewhere she felt safe enough to engage him. This time, I lingered in the shadows, waiting patiently for the proclaimed soulmate. Sebastian paced outside of the cafe, mumbling to himself, probably practicing his anticipated monologue. Eventually, despite my perceived promise and no-show, Valky walked out of the cafe once her shift ended. She didn't notice Sebastian until he wanted her to. When he stepped out of the shadows to confront her, she stiffened in fear. Leave me alone. Darling, please, I only want... Go away. In a panic, she turned and started running back to the cafe. Predictable. Sebastian grabbed her arm in a panic and shoved her against the nearby wall. Predictable. It won't hurt you. Please, just listen. My turn. Hey, let her go. She's like, I'm gonna be your white knight. I came jogging from around the corner of an alleyway towards the couple, gun aimed. In some other places, the gun would have freaked her out, but not here. Not when she'd been around them since birth. Sebastian, shocked by my appearance and unprepared to defend himself, cautiously raised his hands and took a step away from Valky. Victor, thank God. She immediately ran to my side and stepped behind me. I glared at Sebastian. He had no idea who I was. Turn and leave or I shoot. He hesitated, eyes locked on the terrified girl, but eventually surrendered and left. Once he was out of sight, I lowered the gun and slipped it into my belt. Valky wiped the nervous sweat from her brow. Oh god, that was terrifying. I'm so glad you came. I thought you'd forgotten. Sorry, I got held up at work. I'm glad I rushed over. Me too. Who the fuck is that guy? I did some research over the re weekend. That's why I came to the cafe this morning. I think he's in the Mafia. More panic. Since she didn't know Sebastian's identity or goal, Mafia outside of her immediate family meant someone who wanted to bring her harm, likely due to a desire for money, power, or revenge. I could easily theorize the probable fallout from this event. Valky would soon call up her brother. Once she described Sebastian's appearance, it would be easy for Brandon to identify the man. Brandon would assassinate Sebastian, perhaps even the entire Dalla Rosa family, depending on his mood. However, I wasn't completely certain that was how I want it would play out. There was the wild card of Valky's mortality. It morality, sorry. Typically, it leaned heavily towards good, but not always. That piece of her was consistently unpredictable. It could vary heavily depending on the life, place, and branch. I'd grown to hate things that were not predictable. They added significant complexity to my life. Of course, her mere existence was the core complexity of my life. In this place, with her life experiences, would she fear for her safety more than having Sebastian's blood on her hands? I wasn't sure, but I suspected yes. She currently believed that Mafia translated into evil given her upbringing, and since I'd prevented any conversation with Sebastian, she had no reason to doubt that belief. Shit. Yes, this guy is quite bold to just grab you off the street. Do you have anywhere else you could stay? Family? Friends? He might have followed you home. He may know where you live. 
I already knew the answer. The fearful look in her eyes confirmed it. No one nearby? Uh, I guess I could. There's a hotel nearby. You could stay there. It's inexpensive and they have security cameras. She looked down the at the street, ashamed. I can barely afford my rent. That's fine, I'll pay for the room. And I will at least give you time to make other arrangements. Oh, I couldn't... Cutie, I spend more on lunch this afternoon than I will on this hotel room. Come on, I'll drive you there. The faint blush at the casual and playful compliment told me I'd succeeded. You would now jump for the dangled chocolate. This is so kind of you. Victor held open the door to the hotel room as I entered, admiring the old-fashioned but fancy style. This inexpensive hotel room was certainly not. I wondered if he took me somewhere nicer than the first place he'd originally suggested since he was paying. It's nothing, miss. Please, call me Valky. Oh, if you insist, Valky. He smi I smiled. He was so thoughtful and polite, by far the most courteous man I'd ever met. Courteous man I'd ever met. The complete opposite of everyone else around me. Respectful, kind, generous, selfless. He didn't push, he didn't demand, he cared about what I wanted. I felt safe with him. My heart fluttered with him nearby. I stepped over to the large window. I was on the fourth floor. The streets were filled with shadows. Nervously, I turned on a nearby lamp for additional light, feeling unsettled by the darkness far out of reach. Thank you again. This is probably the kindest thing anyone's ever done for me. There was a great deal of sadness in his frown. I'm sorry to hear that. Oh gosh, I didn't say it for pity. Just thanks. I was so terrified I thought I would faint. Unfortunately, there are some terrible people in this world. Anyway, I won't take any more of your time. Have a good- You're leaving. He smiled and chuckled. Of course, there's a single room. One bed. I blushed heavily. Uh, I'm sorry, I just- You must have a lovely wife to get home to. I shouldn't keep you. Uh, no, I don't. No wife, no partner. But I'm not playing hero here to get in your pants. Oh god, I didn't mean to imply- Ugh. It's just- I guess I'm still nervous? What if that creep followed us here? What if he comes after me again? This hotel has security. There's a peephole in the door and a privacy lock. No one is coming in here unless you let them. I know I'm being paranoid. I'm just... I've never been alone before in a situation like this. I'm scared. He chuckled softly and shut the hotel room door. Well, how can I refuse a damsel in distress? It was easy to make her fall in love with me and get in her bed. Not because she was a slut or anything so degrading. I simply knew her, deeply and intimately. I knew the right words to say, the buttons to push, the little moves and whispered words that made her feel safe and loved and aroused. I sat beside her, each of us with a wine glass, and held her hand. It respectfully communicated my interest. I told her silly stories from various lifetimes that I knew would make her giggle. It put her at ease. I would casually touch her thigh as I refilled her drink. It hinted at my growing desire without putting pressure on her. She was free to kick me out if that interest wasn't returned. I would brush a few strands of hair from her face and behind her ear, which always made her blush. It showed my affectionate, caring nature. I would wrap an arm around her shoulder as I complimented her so she would know I was interested in her, not merely sex. I would lean in and whisper in her ear that I wanted to kiss her, ensuring I had her consent in advance. I would nibble on her neck as my hand explored her body until it ended up between her thighs. Every erogenous zone was lit along the way. Well, we're not saying this. Okay, yep. Mm-hmm. 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 Okay. At this point, I'd likely known her for a thousand years and slept with her a million times. For good or bad, she was the center of my insane world. I knew her better than she knew herself simply because I'd observed her in an unfathomable number of scenarios that she had not experienced. There were many years that I thought of, if I could just somehow make her happy, maybe all this chaos would end. There were many years I thought my job was to save her from her inevitable fated death. There were many years when I wondered if I was stuck in some self-perpetuating purgatory, that something within myself was unfinished or broken. I hoped she was the key to my happiness. There were many years that I suspected I was stuck in her purgatory, and if I could just figure out the puzzle, it would end. There were many years I just observed, confused, frozen without a goal, and afraid to make it worse. There were many years I simply cried as I waited for the world to end, watching her die over and over and over again. I dedicated many lifetimes to understanding everything about her. What other choice did I have? I still remembered the various faces of our many children across different lifetimes, and their many gruesome deaths. Sometimes I missed those children, but I wouldn't dare bring them into another world again. The pain of losing them was too much. Why? Why is this happening? Why won't you tell me anything? Her breathing was slow and soft. She didn't hear my question. She wouldn't have given it a satisfactory answer even if she did. I'd asked that question millions of times by now. What if she didn't know? 
That thought was too terrifying to believe. Because if she didn't know, then no one knew. I was stuck in this looping nightmare forever. I would watch her die again and again until the end of time. The painful thought caused my arms to tense around her. She squirmed slightly and muttered something unintelligible. Her sleeping face was adorable. And yet I hated it. She had to know something. There had to be a reason. A reason why we were stuck in this loop. A reason that I retained my memories. A reason everything always ended in pain and suffering. She knew something. That thought once again filled me with rage. Why wouldn't she tell me? Why couldn't we work together to figure this out? Why did she never trust me enough to confess? Or was this my punishment? My eternal torture? But why didn't I know what I was being punished for? If this was hell, what was the point if I didn't know why? I was so close to her, so familiar with her, so deeply and intrinsically linked with her soul. And yet this secret, this mystery, kept us light years apart. I learned this lesson many times, and yet I inevitably found myself repeating these mistakes over and over, getting close to her, wondering what possible innocent explanation there could be. My soul was not the only thing stuck in a loop. My mind was stuck too, desperately seeking an explanation, searching for answers I could never find. I'd been successfully staying away from her for so many lifetimes now, trying to conjure up a plan or strategy from nothing. I cursed my weakness, but I knew it wasn't purely my lust and loneliness to blame. It was this place. Now that she was mine, my mind was clearing once again, returning to the familiar mental loop of anguish. Idiot. What was the point of this when I knew it would only end in pain and death? I didn't want to be the reason she died again. I didn't want to suffer along with her inevitable demise. What would happen next? I had no idea. Perhaps Sebastian would dodge Brandon's wrath and come to kidnap her. Perhaps she would die in the crossfire between the two. Perhaps a meteor would crash into this building. Perhaps she would live another five years peacefully until a bus crashed into her. I gently adjust adjusted her position to pull myself free, then stood and dressed. My inaction and powerlessness were nearly as painful as the loop itself. It was like I was tied to a chair and forced to watch a gruesome slasher film over and over for eternity. I had to do something. But what? What was left to try? What had I not thought of? I needed something. A sign. A clue. A tool. I glanced at her, nude and sleeping in the bed, before my hand reached the doorknob. I knew it would hurt her to leave like this, but the alternative was too painful for me to stomach. I was tired of watching her die. I was tired of killing her. I was tired. So tired. I could only hope the next world might provide a particle of light in this eternal darkness. Okay. Um... That was Victor. That was all of Victor. Interesting. Definitely given me some stuff to talk about. Uh, to talk about, think about. Okay, I'm going to go on to Alexander's other stuff now, which this will be like out of order because I forgot to do this. Um, so I'm going to mention in later episodes, I forgot to, I will suddenly realize I forgot to do this. Um, so yeah, I will see you then.